Welcome to welcome, welcome to another episode of Pound for Pound Box Report, episode 379. Um, I am your host, Michael. Joining me, uh Gail from Communities Digital News and in NY. Gail from Communities Digital News, um NY Fights. Uh, she was off last week. Of course, she was at the um she was she was she was off. She's back now. Daniel from Four Boxing News and the Inscriber. What's going on, lady and gent? Well, I am back. There's a lot of heat out there. We're gonna put some light on it here in the pound for pound boxing report. Yeah, yeah particularly over the last 24 hours. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> for those who are new to Pound for Pound Box Report, Pound for Pound Box Report, live YouTube show podcast slash blog that discusses all things boxing the model is when boxing is good we'll talk about it when it's bad we will talk about it bottom line is if it returns to the sweet science it will get discussed right here if you want to find out if all the information please go to the site p4pboxingreport.com on the site if you navigate you'll find uh um uh, links to where to check out the pound, pound box report all over the social media realm links to the facebook page links to the youtube channel links to the page on twitter IG Tumblr also links to where you can find the show on podcast platforms or, or RSS uh, distributed fed outlets, uh, be it be it Anchor, be it Apple Podcasts, be it Google Podcasts, be it Spotify, any, anywhere and everywhere else in between. Uh, for the most part, you will find Pound for Pound Box Report. Also on the side, you'll find links to where you can donate. Got to catch me a PayPal donation link. Uh, let donation be the best nation. If you got a little bit of spare change, if you want to uh, contribute, uh, to the pound for pound box support it will be greatly appreciated it'll help the overall uh uh, uh production uh, behind the scenes especially um if you're checking us out live here on youtube or watching this on youtube at a later date uh please make sure you hit that like button make sure you hit that subscribe button um it'll help the overall uh, uh algorithms and get us closer to being monetized last but certainly not least uh as we are uh hitting the fall it's technically fall right now you still it's not too late if you're still looking to get your health and wellness game uh going or uh you want to uh, check out some new fitness programs or take elevate your health and wellness to another level please check out beach body on demand um take advantage of the 14 day free trial and if you access that for 14 days you get free access to any and all programs on beach body on demand i strongly suggest you Give that a look. Check out the various programs there. Um, if you're looking for weightlifting, I check out Lift Four or Lift More. Um, if you're really looking for some really, really hard, uh, challenging functional functional workouts, I suggest you check out Six Weeks of the Work, the P90X, the Insanity and the Insanity and Silence series. They may be old, but they still work. They're still effective. Uh, uh, whether it's Bar Blend, whether it's Morning Meltdown, whether it's Pio, whether it's Bring Your Body. Um, if you're looking for a boxing specific program, uh, check out 10 rounds, a six week program, uh, five days a week of workouts, three of those days, boxing based cardio to two <clears throat> days devoted to uh, resistance and weightlifting. Um, again, uh, beach body on demand. And if, if at the very least, I would ch check out the 14 day free trial. Let's get things going. No real fights to preview this weekend. Very, very light uh, week um so let's recap some fights that took place uh really over the late last week and into the weekend um let's start with a, a card that took place in newark new jersey took place on the 23rd the return of Shakur, Shakur stevenson homecoming if you will fought ropes and concia cal gale it was supposed to be a defense of his unified uh junior lightweight titles the problem is that Shakur uh, came in um, a pound and a half over at the scales. He decided to not go for a second attempt. Gave up his two belts at 130. The fight went on. And despite that problem, Gail, in the fight itself, I was impressed with what I saw from Stevenson because he was in there with a guy who has a lot of boxing skills, right? We saw it uh, in, in his disputed loss to Oscar Valdez September last year, a fight I still believe he won. Um, Stevenson, yes, he did some boxing. The defense was there, but I like the fact that he stepped to Concia Cal. He made Concia Cal back up. I love the way he went to the body. Uh, uh, 
the main, he's he's developing a mean streak. Well, it's always been there, but you really saw it in this fight. He threw punches with mean intentions. Overall, it's another layer that is being being unpe unpeeled within Shakur. The more the the more and more I see him, the more and more I see a guy who's really developing into an all around complete fighter. If he thinks he's just a pure boxer, you are sadly mistaken. He proved that in this fight. He sure did. You know, he does not get a pass for missing weight. He was properly contrite about it. He did have an explanation. It still doesn't mean he should have dealt with reality a little better. And certainly his team is experienced enough. They should have known. He just simply outgrown the division. He said it was very tough for him to make weight for his last fight, but he did it and thought he could eke it out again, and he just couldn't do it. But damn, you know, he let it go right up to the last minute, and that puts the B-side fighter, and, and I say B-side with no disrespect, but the challenger in a horrible position. Do you, you know, pass up your opportunity because, you know, you're now at a greater disadvantage in the ring? No, you know, you take that extra money out of the purse to go forward. And truthfully, I think Conce Sal would have lost anyway, but it's never a good look. So Stevenson, you know, moved forward and, and it wasn't quite the homecoming fight, you know, everybody hoped for. It's always that little, you know, that little black cloud over it. Nevertheless, he put more than 10,000 people in the seats in Newark at the Prudential Center. Those are the biggest audiences there for boxing since um, Tomas Adamek used to fight there under main events, I might add, uh, which is very impressive and exactly what boxing needs to do, develop these local markets with fighters who are from the region. What we also saw is what the new look Shakur Stevenson's going to present to us moving forward as he is gaining man strength, gaining muscle. He's starting to gain punching power. He's starting to layer on offensive aggression over all those incredibly impressive defensive skills. And he is all just going to be more and more and more of a terror to anybody standing across from him. At 135, there's a lot of good fights for him to make. It's not a bad thing at all that he's moving up. I just wish he'd done it without having missed it on the scale in his last fight at 130. Really unfortunate. But he took Conceição, a very good fighter, a very good fighter, took him apart. That just shows you the, the skill level. The reason we're all so excited about him is we really haven't seen what the limits are yet for him. He's he's this good now. How good is he going to get? And I think he'll get better and better as he gets challenged more. But so far, there have been very few people standing across from him to present that level of challenge. Once that happens, I think we're in for a real treat. Gail mentioned, Daniel, that that mentioned the talent um, of Shakur and up to this point he hasn't really been challenged there were there were those who thought he would get that challenge when he beat when he beat when he fought when he faced Jamel Herring um last year wasn't the case even more thought he would get that challenge when he fought Oscar Valdez in the unification battle uh, uh earlier this year it wasn't the case right dominated both men and if he's to get that challenge, it's certainly going to be at 135. Stevenson announced when he failed to make the weight that he's moving up to 135. Afterwards, they asked about who he would like to fight. Of course, he mentioned he mentioned Haney. He, he, he mentioned Lomachenko. And should he be criticized for missing the weight? Absolutely. Uh, you have, he has to be held accountable that, to that. However... I'm not going to be that mad at him because moving up to 135 and when you look at the potential opponents there with Haney, 
with Lomachenko, with Tank Davis, right? Ryan Garcia, if he decides to move back down to 135, uh, uh, even someone like a Pitbull Cruz, uh, someone of that, of that nature, uh, I really want to see what he does at, at 135, particularly if he gets to fight either a Haney or a, a Lom on Lom Lomachenko. Um, your thoughts on um, Haney, excuse me, on, on Shakur Stevenson uh, moving up and, and the potential uh, at lightweight. Well, <clears throat> I, it is a little bit sad to see him lose the titles on the scale, but I'm like I said, we were surprised that Shakur was able to stay at 130 for as long as he did. And, and unfortunately, his body caught up to him. That's understandable. And when it came to this this particular performance, it reflected the skill set that how vast the chasm is compared to what Kosciakow faced against Valdez. Because when Kosciakow fought Valdez, we all had a pretty good argument that there's a good chance that Kosciakow actually won that fight. <laughs> And in this case, Shakur took control almost from the immediate beginning. Even with a point deduction, it was still an effective, very businessman-like, efficient night out when it came to Shakur. Now, the challenges that he faces at lightweight, it's going to be interesting because luckily the majority of the contenders are on his side of the fence. So he can, if he need, I don't know if they allow it because he, if he loses weight, if he loses the weight, the title on the scale, but he could pull WBO shenanigans to try to be the mandatory. And that runs into Lomachenko. That's the fight that top rank has positioned both of these men to have had for a good while. That was the plan. Lomachenko versus Shakur. So that's still on track. Haney, it, that would be a good, interesting styles because they're both boxers. They're both high IQ. The main difference would be is who would turn the aggression first. Ryan, Ryan to me is in the same part, same area that Shakur is as far as weight. I don't really see him going back down to lightweight unless an obscene amount of money is offered in order for him to cut those extra five pounds. I think he's pretty set at 140 from what it looks like. The only name that I'm pretty sure he's not going to fight is Tank. Mainly because there's a reason why Tank hasn't fought people like Haney, Shakur, Loma. Because as powerful of a puncher as Tank is, he can be outboxed. And Shakur, Haney, and especially Loma, those guys are really, really good boxers who could probably best Tank pretty easily when it comes to skill. And not to mention, again, unfortunately, when you look at the business, it's Bob versus Floyd. And Bob and Floyd do as little business together as they possibly can. So that's where it ships up to. Now, one fighter that I would probably like to see him with, because he is a little bit of a bulldog, is Isaac Cruz. I would not mind seeing Shakur versus him because then you have a come forward fighter that is willing to eat punches to get to where he needs to be and knows he has power in order to hurt his opponent. Shakur luckily does have a pretty good amount of challengers that you can look into when it comes to lightweight for as long as he can stay. The way it looks when it comes to Shakur, there's a good chance that within two years he'll be at welterweight already. Well, part of the reason that you won't see the other part of the reason that that you will not see Tank in there is because Floyd and 
Floyd and 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 Ellerby, excuse me, uh, uh, they're more worried about about Tank being a cash cow than they are putting um, Tank in matches to prove that he's the best in the division. Uh, they see him as a, a money maker. They see him as a a, a pay per view star. They don't see him as one of the best uh, uh, pound for pound fighters in the world. That's the sad reality. Uh, um, the question now becomes, Gail and, and and Daniel. I mentioned I mentioned Lomachenko. I mentioned Haney specifically, and Daniel talked about they are on the same side of the street. In your opinions, when is the earliest we'll be able to see Haney? I mean uh, Shakur against the likes of a Haney, against the likes of a Lomachenko, because if I'm top rank, that's where I would uh, angle him towards uh, a fight with either of those men at some point. Oh, yeah, that meeting, that intersection has got to happen. But don't, nobody should be marking their calendar. First of all, Haney's got business with George Cambosis. We all assume that he's going to take care of it. I think that's a pretty sure bet, but it still needs to happen. And then... It's very likely we're going to see Haney and Loma, and we'll need to see how that all plays out. Given, you know, how infrequently these guys at the top fight, I really think that means we're going to have another year tick off the calendar before there's any real serious discussion about Devin Haney and Shakur Stevenson, and it, it might even drag out beyond that. We'll see. Uh, they're both very young, which is to our benefit. It their primes I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing i'm hearing myself say this their prime years may be five years away late 20s so the only thing with Haney and stevenson is they really do have time do we want to see it oh yeah will we see a better fight a few years down the road yeah might we see a great you know, series trilogy, very possible. They'll find opponents um, in the meantime. You know, they're both enough of a draw. Uh, Haney, you know, let's be honest, is not everybody's idea of, you know, a big banger, good time. But his titles, his stature alone does draw an audience, depending on who's standing in front of him. And, and Shakur has got, you know, a growing building fan base you know the, the butts in the seats we saw in new jersey were proof of that so there's a lot of business they can do until their paths cross but their paths will need to cross no question and th there's really no reason that fight can't be made yeah I, absolutely i i again i i was thoroughly i was really impressed by what I saw with Shakur, and I really can't wait to see what he does at 135 pounds. And him and Lomachenko is just the sports uh, uh, talk about the ultimate chess match, especially if if Lomachenko is on his A game or anywhere close to the fighter that we saw up until the tail the defeat to uh, Teofimo, which I personally think was a one off. Uh, I didn't get Lomachenko's strategy for the first half of that bout in Teofimo. I thought he fought over his head. Hasn't fought that well before. He hasn't fought nearly close to that level since. Uh, Haney, it, that's also pretty much a toss-up as well. I just want to see Shakur in the ring with, with either man. If, they, if Floyd and Leonard Edwards uh, release, let, Hain, let uh, Tank actually fight someone, a, a tank Shakur Stevenson bout would be entertaining as well. Uh, uh, let's hope it happens eventually. Let's move on from New, New Jersey over to uh, the UK, England specifically for a series of fights. And I'll go to you on this one, Daniel. Uh, heavyweight matchup that took place, uh, WBO interim belt, right? Uh, Joseph Parker, who's a former champion, he stepped in the ring against Joe Joyce. And the thing I questioned about Parker, Daniel, was his toughness, was his heart. Did it, does he have the grit? Does he have the eye of the tiger at this point of his career? He needed it if he had any chance to defeat a Joe Joyce. 
And he showed it. He showed the toughness and whatever. The problem is he is he was in the ring with basically an oak tree with boxing gloves and a hell of a jab, right? Uh, I don't know, Daniel, if there's an outright tougher heavyweight uh, in the world. I don't know, Daniel, if there's a guy who has the ability to absorb the amount of punishment that George Joyce can. And that's aspect about him, plus that ramrod of a jab, plus his punching power, just proved to be too much for Parker. Uh, bless his heart. He tried as hard as he could, but, you know, just the bombardment that is Joe Joyce, constant, constantly in your face, constantly in fire pressure. The size, the strength, the power, the ability to eat punches up like Pac-Man on steroids uh, was just too much. It was just too much, and he stopped Parker in the 11th round. Your thoughts on the fight? <clears throat> There's a term I think that we use here in this country that can describe people like Joe Joyce. Country strong. Right. Yeah, Joe Joyce is country strong. And not only is he country strong, like country folk, that power does not leave when you age. And that's one of the things about Joe Joyce. He isn't, at least in this era right now, a, an older heavyweight. So, a lot of the more prevalent and louder names are younger than him. And yet, in this fight, particularly against somebody like Parker, who, for a heavyweight, can move fairly well and does have pretty decent hand speed, Joyce just kept coming. And it wasn't it wasn't a Klitschko type of scenario where he, he was just going to smother you with his size into it. He maintained distance. He peppered Parker throughout the fight with the jab and ate a good amount of Parker right hands too in order to do so. There were a couple of moments that you could tell where if Parker would have landed the punch in on some other fighters, those fighters probably would have been rocked, but Joyce does have a pretty decent chin. And it was just a war of attrition. As much as Parker tried to, particularly in the ninth and tenth round, tried to rally with a few combinations, you could tell just the presence of Joyce. Like I said, the way he just kept coming with the jab, the way he just kept eating his punches, it it took the fight out of him. And the way he had ended 11, short crisp left hook and Parker just went down like a tree and barely got up right as the count of 10 ended which means Joe Joyce the first person to ever really truly knock out Joseph Parker which tells you again the toughness of Joseph Parker but it also does tell you that yeah that I know we tend we can clown a little bit when it comes to British heavyweights, considering some of the ways to market it. And considering in the Frank Warner stable, we all thought that more than likely just because of the age, Daniel Dubois was gonna be the person that was gonna shape up. But yeah, the juggernaut stands tall here. The thing about Joyce Gale is that no matter who he's in the ring with. He forces his opponent to fight his fight, to fight his style of fight, right? I, I mentioned all the other attributes, physical and intangible. Also, he has, uh, uh, for a guy his size, he has excellent conditioning. So he gets this win, right? And he'll be, he's, he'll become mandatory for to for for one of Usyk's belts. Uh, shout out to a uh, uh, Jacob. Uh, who you've heard on this show numerous times, he was mentioning to us that he had seen some stuff on his timeline afterwards with folks uh, suggesting that Joyce, the way that he uh, uh, pressures and eventually makes fighters cave in, he that he could do the same thing. He has the ability to do the same thing or he could do the same thing 
in a possible fight with Usyk. Now, we know Usyk is on the shelf right now. He has said that he will not fight. He's not going to he's going to be out of the ring for a significant amount of time. We all know his the situation in his home country. He wants to be with his family and, and whatnot. He's also dealing with some injuries. He wants to uh, be full. He wants to be 100 percent next time he gets back into the ring. But what do you think of this simmering conversation that we're seeing on boxing social media, particularly Twitter, uh, with folks now suggesting that if Joyce were to get in the ring with an Usyk, uh, 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 he would beat him. He's I got don't see it, but what, he's got a chance. I mean, he certainly the opportunity is there, the talent is there, the chin is certainly there, the stamina is there. Will it happen? Well. Usyk has made his feelings about what he'd like to do optimally very clear. He wants to unify. He potentially would be interested in a cruiserweight fight with Canelo. So he says, I think Usyk's trolling. That man has a wicked sense of humor. I, I, I can hardly believe he really thinks that's even a possibility now. But he said it. But he said it. And then he wants to end his career with a homecoming fight in Kazakhstan. That will not be against an opponent who's a real threat. I'm not really seeing Joe Joyce's name on the dance card. Do we like the idea? Sure we do. I'm not sure Alexander Usyk thinks he's got a lot more to prove. And he is one of those fighters that has a very rich life outside of boxing. So I don't think we're going to see him in the pro ranks. The truth is Usyk matches up to anyone. Usyk is a problem for anyone. He's a great style matchup, almost no matter who's standing across from him. Wouldn't you love to see him against Deontay Wilder? Wouldn't you love to see him against Tyson Fury? Wouldn't you love to see him against Anthony Joshua? All of the above. Jared Anderson. There are some really tasty dishes that all involve Joe Joyce as an ingredient. And he is older. And everybody's looking at that birth certificate. Yeah, he's 37. You know, we would love it to be 27 with this kind of skill and promise. But he seems to have done everything right as far as his conditioning, taking care of himself. He doesn't have a lot of miles on the tires, as they like to say. Heavyweights can continue into their 40s. That gives him four or five more years, potentially. That's plenty of time for him to get some really terrifically exciting fights. You know, he is a combination of skills and abilities that in a lot of ways just, just shouldn't work the way they do. But they do. And that's also what makes him so interesting to watch because it he doesn't seem to go down all the requirements and check all the boxes for success. Nevertheless, he's like a zombie. You can't kill him. He just keeps on coming one foot after the other. Boom, boom. It's just like a horror show to his opponents. Um, it's been really fun to watch. He's definitely gaining, gaining fan momentum. Now, we could call it a bandwagon, but that's, you know, what I'm, I'm okay with it. Uh, you know, Joyce is on a roll. People want to roll with him now. Be my guest. Don't know if Frank Warren would let this happen, but I would love to see Joyce fight Wilder. I would love that. I would. Either Wilder knocks him out or either, either Wilder knocks him out or Joyce uh, uh, is too much for Wilder and makes him cave. In, in, in Wilkes. Yeah. Can uh, you imagine seeing Wilder land a really solid textbook bomb squad right hand and Joyce not get rocked? If I you're mean, Wilder, look, if you think, Wilder, if you think, say, oh shit. If you think <laughs> he freaked out when, when, if you think he freaked out when uh, Fury got up from that yeah. final round, knocked down that second fight and rose like the Undertaker, imagine if that was Joyce who he hit like that and didn't even fall smile right. at him and kept coming. And if you're Deontay Wilder, you think what the hell era did I get born in that I had to go up against these two guys from great Britain? Not fair. 
right? I feel sorry for him. You really do. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, terrific win, terrific performance overall, an excellent, excellent heavyweight bout. Um, Joyce is not going to fight for a title anytime soon. We'll see what Warren decides to do with him uh, uh, in the next few heading into 2023 who he decides to put him in the ring with next uh also in the on the undercard here daniel you had the return of amanda serrano of course uh many fans last time out remember her for her thrilling uh, uh fights with katie taylor she came on in the short end of the stick losing by uh split decision you to this day uh, uh you will go to your grave believing that serrano won that fight took place at lightweight fighting uh, taylor for her undisputed titles Serrano moved back down to 126, where she put up her unified belts, WBC, BO version, uh, for the unification bout against Sarah Mahfoud, who's IBF champion. And I would describe this, Serrano won by decision. I would describe this as a workmanlike performance. Had a little bit of trouble uh, uh, cutting off the ring on Mahfoud in the early rounds because Mahfoud was on the move, some would argue running, but as the rounds progressed, Heading into the middle round, she was able to uh, cut distance go and, and get to work and then just really uh, carry things over it and, and, and ran away with the fight in the second half. Talk briefly about the fight itself, but what does Serrano, where does she go from here? Uh, many people want to see a fight uh, between, a rematch between her and Taylor back at 35, but I've heard her also talk about her. She has this desire to uh, become undisputed champion, uh, fight the, uh, the IBF champion. I think her name is Ferreras. Uh, uh, correct me. My apologies if I'm uh, pronouncing her name wrong. Uh, but anyway, here's the proposition. I know that she's talked about becoming undisputed of 126, but the fight with Taylor in April, a huge success, not just in the ring, but outside the ring. She earned a million guaranteed, and when you add the gate receipts and um, and, and other money that uh, came through the that filtered through the bout, she probably earned what one point two to one point five. Why would she not think about think more about engaging in a rematch? Uh, she almost had Tate. She almost knocked Taylor out. Almost stopped her, and the money is there, even if she has to go on the road and travel to uh, uh, Ireland to face to go in a rematch your thoughts on on what uh serrano will do next this is where it's a little bit tough to gauge because like we, like we mentioned last week i'm amanda serrano unfortunately to her big benefit and unfortunately is going to catch up to her good detriment does tend to roam between bantamweight and lightweight that's one, two, three, four, five, five weight divisions that she walks around with in boxing. Not to mention that she does four eight to MMA still. So I, it's a matter of what is more really important to her. Is being undisputed more important to her than effectively feeling like you have to avenge a win in a way against Katie Taylor. A Katie Taylor who is just is still getting older, but because of the situation that happened, will have complete and utter home field, home court, home ring advantage. Now with a man like I said, you're already proven, and yeah, you're right. You're right, Mike. You're already proven that you can beat Katie Taylor, and in reality, you have beaten Katie Taylor. But would it be worth it once again to fluctuate another nine pounds to get this rematch where you're not go you are not going to win on the cards, not in the UK? Or Ireland, you are not going to win on the cards. You have to knock Katie Taylor out in order to get a victory. So tr train either for that. Oh, and by the way, it's kind of funny that there's also the fact that 
the promoters involved in it are now involved in the defamation lawsuit here in this country. Eddie Hearn obviously being Katie Taylor's promoter and as, as sad as it is, Jake Paul being Serrano's quote-unquote promoter. So maybe getting the undisputed at featherweight may provide a little bit less of a legal hurdle because the, unfortunately the situation involving the lawsuit, the formation lawsuit, which Eddie Hearn has brought upon Jake Paul, partly involves the fight with Katie Taylor. So a lot of legal issues would have to be squashed in order to make that fight. So the path of least resistance is probably going to be the best one for Amanda. Getting them to speed her featherweight will work fairly well. It's probably her best weight in reality. So if if it's right there, just do it. Yeah, you can do it, but I don't want to see it. Quickly on this one, Gail. Are the promoters going to F up a, a, a potential rematch between Taylor and Serrano? Because that's still the fight that everybody wants to see. I'm not sure it's entirely the promoters. It's always been said with a lot of these fights that percolate and delay and delay that if the fighters really, really want it, it will happen. They can make it happen. Now, obviously, if Eddie Hearn and Jake Paul are involved in a big civil lawsuit, that's a bit of a problem. But those things do not go on forever. And Deontay Wilder fought Tyson Fury even after a lawsuit. Canelo and Golovkin have both been in court. They managed to get in the ring as well. If they want it, they can do it. But for most of the reasons Daniel said, I would, I would agree with every one of them. Featherweight is by far Serrano's best weight. You know, she is a seven division champion. That's that's just extraordinary, especially because she's done a lot of it virtually simultaneously. Manny Pacquiao is an eight division champion, but he has steadily for the most part come up. He's backtracked and gone up and down a few times in the highest weight divisions he competed in. But Serrano has bounced from featherweight back to super flyweight up to welterweight. It, it's, it's truthfully, it's insane. <laughs> She's been able to do it, but my guess is this, that she knows she cannot do this forever. And if she wants to solidify all the belts at featherweight, which is well within her grasp, and really that is not even that difficult for her, why wouldn't she want to get that, you know, check done, get those fights. She's a big name now. She will have the upper hand in any matchup, home field advantage, anywhere she wants to fight. Smart thing for her to do is collect all those belts. And then Katie Taylor has a little more mileage on her. Katie is older even than Amanda. She is, in a lot of minds, you were wondering, have we seen the plateau? Is she still hanging there at the top level? Are we starting to see the nose point down in the car going downhill just the tiniest little bit? Well, that's what Serrano's thinking. It is to her advantage to drag it out just a little bit more and let Katie get just that much older. Daniel's absolutely right. If this fight's in the UK, Serrano will not win on the scorecards. It will not happen. So she needs to put herself into a position to get a stoppage win against a much bigger opponent. That is rough. But if she's unified at featherweight, you know, it kind of takes the sting out of it if she gets a second loss. You know, the paychecks are important. But Amanda has now been in the position to earn several very large paychecks. So unlike a lot of the other women competitors at the top of their game, you know, she isn't completely driven solely by a big paycheck. Now, all of those factors might disappoint the fans who just want to see that rematch. I do think we will, but I think Amanda Serrano wants to position herself well get some accomplishments under her belt. That will be good for her psyche and her attitude as she goes back in against Taylor. And hopefully we'll see it. But I 
bet it won't be until the end of next year. Sorry, I was on mute. You said uh, next. You said early mid next year. Gail. Oh, I didn't say early. I said late. <laughs> late. Oh God. I, I would say not. at least uh, after, I, at see, least I, I, after I, I, Labor I, Day. At least. Katie's I got another coming up. She could be. Katie's got another fight here on the calendar. You know, does she come out completely uninjured? No cuts. Nothing. She might. She might not. Uh, Serrano's going to have to make these fights to unify. It's going to take some time. And I don't think they're going to want to blow the calendar. I, I hear the grumbling. I hear the grumbling. But strategically, Serrano looks, you know, needs to look out for number one. And she's got a lot of options besides this rematch. I think she wants to take care of her business at featherweight first. And, you know, it is much, much harder for her. I First of all, the fact that she has gone up and down these seven divisions, you know, within short spans of time, is just truly mind blowing to me. And trust me, to a lot of other women who are basically the same size, um, she's not going to be able to do that forever either. So she needs to take care of her business now at featherweight before she goes back up and can't make it back down again. That was one important thing I forgot to add. So bear that in mind as well. That's a very practical consideration that's in play as well uh i hope they fight sooner than, than, than late next year we'll see uh, uh what happens um also in england not on this same card as uh, uh joyce and parker and serrano in her fight against my food this was this fight that i'm talking about took place on the zone we previewed it last week. Pretty intriguing. Uh, uh, junior middleweight, women's junior weight title bout between um, IBF champion um, Hannah Rank. Excuse me, yeah, IBF champion Hannah Ranking and Terry Harper, uh, Daniel and Gail. I'm going to include both of you into this discussion. Uh, we made a comparison between Harper and Natasha Jonas, who used to fight at 130, 135. Uh, moved all the way up to 154 and has become unified champion. Harper is attempting to do the same thing, move up from similar weights to win a title at junior middleweight, fought ranking, and she won, and she was quite impressive in doing so. Uh, you, you, it's one thing to look at someone in videos and they move up significantly in weight, in her case, 20-plus uh, pounds, and uh, look at her body and uh, – she looks in shape, but once the bell rings and she's in there and has to deal with a larger, more physically stronger, a stronger opponent, uh, that's where the motorboat really moves, right? But she was able to, we knew coming in that she was the faster fighter and the better mover with the legs. But um, for me, the strength was there. And I thought she also landed some shots in there where she got Hannah Rankin's attention, particularly in round seven, she hit her with a right hand uh, right on the button, uh, which Hannah Rankin felt overall. Uh, Harper, she got the decision, and Gail Daniel, the thing that comes to my mind in the af aftermath, uh, all roads lead to a Terry Harper, Natasha Jonas, junior middleweight, women's junior middleweight unification bout, Early midpoint of 2023, they fought before at 130. Uh, Harper defended her then WBC belt. I thought that Jonas won that night. The question is now, all these years, these a uh, couple of years later, with the two moving up, uh, uh, how would they fare in a rematch all the way at 154? Uh, ladies first, get on this one. You know, I, I am not, you know, it's a toss up fight, I think, but to me, Jonas, despite her record has the momentum on her side. So if this fight is to take place anytime soon, I would be inclined to 
give the nod to Jonas, who I think would probably be the betting underdog. But it's a great British fight. You know, we've had, uh, the, we were just talking about Serrano and Taylor. So there you've got, you know, an Irish champion, a, a British Isles superstar. Now you've got a domestic fight that has the opportunity to be a barn burner. Neither of these ladies are very tactical. <laughs> I think they will just bring it. I I just sense that Jonas is the one who's on the upswing. So I would see her as being able to take this win. I mean, it would absolutely be the pinnacle of her career, a career she has really fought for, no, no pun intended. You know, she has just kept at it, kept at it, kept at it. You know, she came, she came close several times, and then she has finally gotten some of the successes she's always wanted. Love to see it. Brief word on on Harper's win over Rankin, and is, and uh, also uh, chime in, Daniel, on what I think is an ine inevitable rematch between um, Harper and Jonas at some point in 2023. First, Harper looked a lot, a lot healthier in this weight class. And one of my worries is that that drastic jump, if she would probably lose a little bit of speed or if it was too much of a drastic jump, but she looked comfortable and she looked healthy. That's the key part of it. She looked healthy. She still had her hand speed. And it looks like the weight did help her a little bit when it came to punch resistance. And that really helps out particularly after the way she lost to Baumgartner. Now, when it comes to the future, yeah, right now all roads are lead. If you're Terry Harper, all roads lead back to a rematch with Jonas. And I would have to agree with Gail. Jonas is a little bit more, more established in the weight class. She had a little bit more time to settle in. Even though I mentioned like, that Harper looks really good and healthy at this weight class for his first fight, it's only one fight. We have to see how you're going to do now with somebody that put himself in a similar situation, but has been there longer. And Jonas, her story is a really, really good story. So that should be probably the main fight that you can see. And I agree, but you probably see Jonas being the one that pulls out a little bit better in that one. Indeed, indeed. And um, uh, uh, Jonas has had even before this fight with Harper and Renko, Jonas said she had her eye on it in the aftermath. Uh, said she's interested in fighting Jonas. Uh, let's hope it happens um, at some point next year. Let's move on to get to some news here. Like I said, we're not going to do any uh, real previews of fights because it's a really, really light. Uh, nothing really of note happening uh, this upcoming weekend. But so let's get, let's get to some news here. And... A lot of discussion, a lot of room, a lot of uh, rumors and whatever involving Tyson Fury. We've been talking about this for the past few episodes, this back and forth when it comes to a possible fight with Anthony Joshua. As, uh, for those who do not know, uh, Fury uh, came out, said he had uh, sent an offer to Joshua. Joshua and Eddie Hearn said that they agreed to it. They are contemplating it. Con not just contemplating not They agreed to it. And they've sent it to their lawyers and whatnot to look over the contract. Okay, bet. Um, in the past, let's just say 48 hours or so, uh, Fury has made, uh, 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 given a deadline, which was, uh, given a deadline, which was yesterday, the 26th, uh, gave a 5 p.m. 5 p.m. Uh, British deadline. It passed. Uh, Joshua was saying that they're just looking over with the lawyers and whatnot. Fury's saying that the, he's he's moved on, right? And then all of a sudden, you get this back and forth on Instagram between Fury and Manuel Char. Char claims that he has a contract with Fury. Uh, Fury has said, yeah, let's do it. Gail, Daniel, what do you make of all of this? Personally, I'm getting tired of Fury uh, doing this kind of thing with this fight with Joshua. Um, 
was he serious all along with this, especially given what Char has said in the past 24 hours? Uh, this make, this is making my head spin, and this is frustrating me, uh, frustrating me all at the same time. Oh, man. Fury is being Fury. Haven't we all learned what he's about? You know, sound and fury signifying nothing, as Shakespeare once wrote. How fitting. Fury loves the sound of his own voice. And you know what? A lot of his fans do, too. And it almost doesn't matter what comes out of it. I don't think sometimes he even knows what's coming out of it. But guess what? We're all talking about him. There is some shit else going on this week. It's a slow week. So what are we talking about? Tyson Fury. And who was smart enough to get on the bandwagon? Char, who I think is still owed money by Don King, right? I think. Putting himself in the mix. Well, what the hell? Why not? And maybe they're, maybe they're on the up and up. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're telling the truth. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're doing it for their own damn, ent and damn entertainment because they're bored. That, that would be a Tyson Fury. He knows how to keep people talking about him. Even when he's out of the ring, that's to his benefit. He wants to keep fans engaged. Anyone that leans in and picks up the rope that he's thrown out there and pulls back, you know, it's your fault for getting into that psychic tug of war with Tyson Fury. Listen, he is what he is. Everybody should know by now to take nothing he says too seriously until it is backed up in writing by a third party with the juice to make it stick. When a promoter sends out an official announcement that there's a fight and all the right names are there and there's a date and there's a venue and tickets are on sale, great, you can take it to the bank. Until then, treat it, treat it as your favorite streaming entertainment, nothing more. Don't get wound up around the axle. Do not make travel pl plans and certainly do not make non-refundable travel plans, which no one should do in boxing anyway. But listen, I'm watching all this and thinking, all right, if we're not going to get Joshua, okay. Char, eh, you know, if we're going to go for a fight on that level, let us bring in an opponent coming off the best knockout win of his career, a name that some people know who's also got his own sort of infamy. I say Tyson, Fury, Curtis, Harper, make it happen. What do you make of all of this? Uh, to Gail's point, unless there's an official contract signing, we see a press conference. Uh, yeah, take everything he says with a grain of salt. At this point, he's coming off of the proverbial person who likes to say things to get a rise out of attention as great of a fighter as he is um, outside the ring, a lot of times is much left to be desired. <laughs> you what know, did I say? You know what you did I tell you? Curtis Harper fight, you know you love it. No, no, I, what did I say last week? What did I say last week or, or the weeks before? Whenever you <laughs> mentioned this, whenever you mentioned Anthony Joshua, and when it comes to Tyson Fury, it's the good old retail, retail brand bait and switch with Tyson Fury now. He's gonna talk a bit of a he's gonna talk a bit of a fight to get people talking. Like I mentioned, that he as soon as he mentioned in that press conference for that for the Clash of the Castle WWE pay per view that he had an opponent the week after that. As soon as he mentioned that, I knew, like, okay, he's already got a softball lined up. People had to read. He was never going to be serious about jo uh, about the Joshua fight. All this was set up was so that when he makes the inevitable announcement that he's going to fight Char, the blow isn't as hard because the Brits will, the Brits will just say, oh, well, he, he tried to make the fight with AJ. He tried to make the fight with AJ. This is the way it is. And they'll, they'll find a way to blame Andy Hearn for it. That's what it is. This is what it is when it comes to Tyson Fury. Now, I will say this. 
and I'll say and I'll say this as seriously and comically as possible, probably. If Manuel Char is the actual opponent for Tyson Fury, if I'm Mauricio Suleiman, don't just don't take him seriously anymore. Strip him of the belt. Then just make Wilder versus Hellenius for the vacant WBC title and then have Wilder fight Ruiz and make Ruiz the mandatory. That's all you need to do because right now we know he's never going to fight Usyk because Tyson Fury knows that Usyk will beat him. So if he if he's never going to make that fight, and that's the only fight to make if you're talking about legacy and being undisputed heavyweight, and you're never really going to be serious about making an Anthony Joshua fight, you pretty much don't have a leg to stand, don't have the leg to stand on. Just call Stanford, call Triple H, just say, hey, I'm, hey, mate, I'm WWE full time. I'll do." All the Saudi shows, because it is about the money. This is this is what Tyson Fury does. And yeah, if, if anybody really fell for it, y'all should have known better, a lot, lot better. Yeah, again, until I see some, if I see some ironclad, until I see a, a real press conference with Fury, uh, uh, and Warren and Aram. And a fight is a go with him. Yeah, it, it, it it's whatever with him. All the, the 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 talk and stuff on social media, be it IG, be it Twitter, be it Facebook. Yeah, uh, miss me with it. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, all the buzz was Crawford Spence agreed in principle to a deal, November nineteenth, Vegas. Right, um, we're recording this on September the twenty seventh. Still no update. Simply put, uh, Daniel Gale, if they're really going to fight in November on the nineteenth, when are we going to see some kind of press conference? Because time is moving on. Honestly, you're. Pretty much now, even by PBC standards, past the point where you have to do a press conference and let both Spence and Crawford have legitimate training camps. Unfortunately, I think you passed that point, which leads me to the reality that I've that I've accepted all this entire year that we were not going to see this fight this year. As soon as I heard, agree to. But then the words in principle, and it's with the lawyers. I knew this fight was not going to get that. You, if you leave it purely at the hands of the lawyers, the lawyers will find a way to end it. Because any lawyer will, if they're true to their name, if they're true to their for, to their oath, they're going to look out for what's best for their client. And we've seen this scenario over and over and over again. We just talked about it with the heavyweights. How many times have we mentioned that if it was up to Wilder and it was up to Joshua, we would have seen them fight five years ago already. Tyson Fury would have probably never fit into the equation at that point. But Obviously, business interest prevented that from happening. And now that still remains, barring, barring some pretty decent negotiations within the next year, one of the great what-ifs in the sport. And this is looking to be similar in the case because you can say now, like, okay, there's no real political barriers. like, But for all intents and purposes, as a free agent and... Nothing from the lawsuit with top rank is so far, keyword, so far, looking like it would drag him into courts for the next three months or next two months in reality. And since we, 
we didn't see anything saying he signed with Matchroom. Or they signed with Golden Boy. So really, there's nothing that should stop him. And Spence, as far as conversations go, and as far as making the fight, from making it. Outside of their own egos. And what they're saying to their lawyers. Because you, anybody, any two people can agree to fight, but as the, as the saying goes, the devil is in details. And I'm like I said, I'm starting to be, actually, I've, I've been in this mindset for a while that main way that we're probably going to see Bud fight this year is if Oscar pushes the issue with the WBO and Virgil and then make it a mandatory defense state this year. Otherwise, I don't uh, think we're going to see them this year. Uh, given your many contacts, Gil, uh, and your inside info, have you heard anything regarding any update uh, in terms of progress on, on getting this fight finalized? The news I have is the same news we talked about a few weeks ago, where I expressed grave skepticism that this was going to happen, that word from somebody in a position to know not a member of the media in the camps said not happening. The sticking point is on the Crawford side without pointing fingers. Um, it doesn't mean it can't get worked out, but if everyone is worked up about this November 19th date, that I, I truly do not think is going to happen. Does that mean the fight is off forever? No, it does not. It was my opinion then, it's still my opinion, that the better promotion is to wait until after the first of the year, tie it in with Super Bowl promotion, just as Fox did with Wilder and Fury, to try to gin up revenue for what is going to be a very expensive fight. And I, you know, I hate to, to state the obvious for those of us who are true boxing fans, but Casual fans have only a minor awareness of Errol Spence Jr. and Terrence Bud Crawford. It's a shame. It's unfortunate, but it's the truth. There is not the built-in draw like the heavyweights or the built-in rivalry that occurred with the improbable pair. Looking back on it, I, I think we'll be surprised as history goes along between Canelo and Triple G. So they've got to really make sure they can maximize the gate, the pay-per-view, pump it up. It's going to take a lot of promotion. Now, promoters do not take the fighters on these multi-city promotional tours like they used to. The last really big one was Mayweather McGregor, um, which is an absolute shit show for most of it. If anything, sometimes there's a promotional appearance in New York and one in Los Angeles, and that's it. But even now, it's usually one appearance. A lot of it can be done remotely. So there isn't this magical promotional need for eight weeks, really. I, but I just don't think that's the point because then everybody else, the machine has to get on board. Both Spence and Crawford, you know, they stay pretty fit. They're going to not they're not going to be beating a maximum training camp. Uh, Crawford in particular stays in pretty good shape. He's active outside the ring. He's very involved in his kids wrestling endeavors. Um, Errol Spence works in a, works his ranch for Pete's sake. So they don't need a fat camp. They don't need three months. Uh, they're veteran enough that, you know, overtraining is really more a problem for both of them. That part doesn't concern me. I just think that fans who are very close to this and who want it don't recognize what a marketing challenge this is going to be. And doing it right before the Thanksgiving holidays in the United States, I'm just not liking the timing of it. I'm just not. So we'll see what happens. But it was my opinion that this fight wasn't going to be made in 2022. I stand by it. 
Mm, mm, mm. And we'll keep you uh, continually updated here on, on the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. A uh, bit of controversy, and I, I'm a bit of warning here. We're going to get into a controversial topic here. Uh, Clarissa Shields was a guest on the Last Stand podcast with Brian Custer, and within the midst of them with, of them chopping it up, the name of Canelo Alvarez was mentioned, and uh, Shields was talking about fighters that she would like to see Canelo fight. Uh, she mentioned uh, Jamal Charlo, uh, WBC middleweight champion. She mentioned she would love to fight. Uh, she would love to see uh, Canelo fight. Uh, David Benavidez, who's WBC interim 168-pound champion, right? And then she also mentioned um, Demetrius Andrade, who recently vacated the WBO belt at 160, moving up. He's in line uh, to fight for an interim title at 168 pounds, right? And when in the midst of their conversation, she mentioned uh, what Canelo... She had said basically that Canelo, you know, it's time that you fight these fighters. Uh, uh, boxing fans want to see you in the ring with them. And she, and she uh, and within that, she said she talked about how Canelo said he wouldn't fight Mexican fighters, something that's on the record, right? But in the context of Charlo and Andrade, she said that he also doesn't fight black fighters as well. Uh, I wrote about this for Three Kings Boxing.com. For Three Kings Boxing, you can find the article on Three Kings Boxing.com. And, and in the aftermath, uh, a lot of talk has been mentioned. Uh, Three Kings Boxing Facebook page has been fueled with comments uh, in the aftermath all day long, right? And I get what Clarissa was trying to say. Uh, that Canelo, in her mind, is avoiding fighters. And I get, she's trying, to, in my opinion, she's trying to make a statement that, is she saying that Canelo is not fighting black fighters ever? No, because that would be a lie. I think she's trying to say that Canelo has, re Canelo has reached a point in his career that, that, he doesn't fight top black fighters in their prime anymore. She's trying, in my opinion, she's trying to she's trying to say that uh, you got these guys, particularly Charlo and Andrade, who have been calling you out for years. Why do you not get in the ring with them? Benavidez has been calling you out for a while, and after your last fight, Canelo, you went over Golovkin. You were very dismissive of him so i get the frustration the problem is the wording that she used to put it uh shout out to uh 2k prodigy of boxing talk and uh bo uh 2k the uh man behind three kings boxing bo had a media relation you've heard him on the show numerous times before right and he what he was he was basically saying the same thing that her wording was off and that when people like Shields, who has a habit of saying things, not putting it in proper context, uh, he used this as an argument to suggest that the one thing that's sorely missing in boxing is PR, folks. He's absolutely, I agree with him wholeheartedly. This is where Shields needed a PR person because the what she felt, what she is feeling didn't come out correctly and as a result uh she's in a bit of a dust up here right and again people if you're a canelo fan uh you're highly upset and yeah uh yeah controversy has ensued in the past 24 hours since the the last latest episode of last stand podcast dropped i'll go to you Gail and Daniel, your reaction to the interview, your reaction to the uproar that she has received by some in boxing circles, particularly Canelo Alvarez fans. There is more than a little sexism going on here. Clarissa Shields is a polarizing figure in part because she is a very strong-willed, strong-minded woman who speaks bluntly 
it's sometimes it's not the prettiest language. It's not the most refined statement. A lot of men would say exactly the same thing and not take a, a fraction of the heat she gets. I'm going to lay that right out there. I believe it firmly and that's always going to be a problem for her. It is what it is. She um, excuse me for interrupting Gail to your point. Um, in reaction to what I wrote on Three Kings, if you want to say that Clarissa was wrong for what she's saying, fair enough, okay? I was just reporting what she actually said word for word. But when people came on there, it was like, well, she's a woman. She doesn't know any better. She's doing this for attention. Or she's just a women's boxer. People don't watch her, watch them anyway. That's where I had to personally go in and push back. Okay, are you are are is your beef with what she said, or is your beef is because she's a woman? Because some of to your point, some of the pushback I've received is not true criticism; it's misogyny and sexism under the guise of critique, and that's wrong. Absolutely right, and thank you for saying so, Michael. A lot of people, it's not that they have a problem with what Claressa says. They have a problem with Claressa. It doesn't matter what she says. There's always going to be an element like that, you know, and it, and it veers from the um, sort of microaggression end of things. It's like, well, she just does, you know, she's a woman. She can't be expected to, you know, know what she's saying, right? That's, that's the demeaning, belittling, they're there, pat on the head kind of thing. On the other end are the haters who simply don't like her, whatever their reasons, there's many of them, you know, there are people who simply do not like strong personalities of many types, female boxers being one. There have been dozens, maybe hundreds, going all the way back, male boxers who brag on themselves, who talk about how great they are, who show off their physique, we talk about their training, talk about kicking everyone's ass. They would never, ever get the kind of heat Clarissa does. Just, she's, for whatever reason, by her simple existence, rub people the wrong way. Well, they'll just need to get over it. Or maybe you want to look the other way. Now, let's go to what she actually said. I think she stated it poorly. Yes. It's nice to say that they need PR people. I, I am a PR people. <laughs> I run a public relations firm. That is my skills to pay the bills. I've done it for a long time. I have advised people that are famous, that are elected officials, that are CEOs. Um, and hopefully you're at their ear and at their arm and at their high level meetings to get them to think about what they're saying before they do it and stop before they do something stupid or impulsive or emotional. Yes, male business leaders and elected officials can be emotional and get them to think long-term about the consequences. But that is asking a lot from human nature. And on the other hand, fans get pissed. Oh, they've got handlers. Oh, they have spokespeople. Ah, you know, uh, uh, cleaning this stuff up, pretty, prettying up the conversation. Now, it doesn't mean anything, and they hate it. They hate the thought of it. So what is the athlete supposed to do, especially in this era of social media where everybody is supposed to be their unvarnished, unfiltered, authentic self, like we believe that's really happening? I I'd like to sit you down and talk to you and wise you up if you really think that's what's going on most of the time. Um, and when these people do present their unvarnished self, you, you land on them like a ton of bricks. So, you know, what's somebody supposed to do? And believe me, people in my position, especially in athletics, where people are earning, you know, uh, a lot of money, have contracts and sponsorships worth millions and millions, they can pay for absolutely the best advice. And you know what? If they have half their wits about them, they do. Um, Clarissa isn't quite in that stratosphere of earning money. Um, and some people simply aren't going to take your advice. And I've worked with a lot of people like that too. My obligation is to lay out 
the potential for certain remarks to go badly, to be taken the wrong way, not what is intended. I give my best advice. It's up to the client whether they take it or not. As long as I've made my case, my job is done. I suspect that happens with a lot of these athletes. All right, on to what she said. Listen, Canelo has made his position very clear. And this is the same position of every A-side fighter out there. They have earned more money than they can possibly spend, most of them, especially if they have been careful. And they get to the point where they really think carefully about the risk versus reward ratio. There's an old saying in boxing, we were talking about it before the show. Boxing is a business disguised as a sport. So these guys, like Canelo, look at the potential return on investment for a fight. All right. And everybody measuring the ROI of a fight with Canelo says, oh, hell yes. Whether or not they think they could win, that risk versus reward shifts in the other direction. They're willing to take the chance to get their ass kicked for the payday. Right? Which is exactly what Canelo said when Demetrius Andrade, you know, bombed his post-fight news conference. You just want a payday. Well, there's really nothing wrong with that. They're in the sport to make money. It's a job, right? There's glory and history and a lot of other wonderful things that go with it. But bottom line is they do this for money. So if you're going to fight Canelo, you get a massive paycheck, the biggest payday of your life at this point. Everyone says yes. On Canelo's side, what do they bring to the table? Money is great. He made, he's made a buttload of money. He made probably 50 to $60 million two weekends ago. That is not the primary driver for Canelo at all. It's going to be legacy at this point. It's going to be racking up wins, uh, notching more accomplishments, on the record book and he's not going to ruin his career or risk a loss against somebody that doesn't bring something else to the table belts are important uh the golovkin trilogy brought money and you know there was a legacy there to complete i think canelo could have gone without that third fight but it eventually got demanded and you know, we all saw that it turned out to not be it, what we quite expected. But a lot of these guys that want to get in the ring with Canelo don't bring enough of a new audience, new revenue stream. They don't offer belts. Yeah, Andrade has belts at middleweight. Canelo is never fighting at middleweight again. Andrade isn't going to make a big enough revenue fight back when Canelo was still finding it middleweight. That was a non-starter. He, he brought a belt to the table, but he brought very little else, a tricky style. Canelo had other options and he took them. Now Andrade has sort of talked himself out of the opportunity. The fight that we all do want to see, I'd love to see. I would love to see Canelo Alvarez fight David Benavides. It would. But David is younger. David is bigger. David is very tall. <laughs> he is. He he could easily fight someday down the road at light heavyweight. It won't be that long. It really won't. And David has no real title to offer. Canelo is the unified champion. So Canelo's attitude, which he's expressed many times. If anyone was listening, and if you didn't happen to catch it, let me repeat it for you. He thinks that all these guys who want a fight with him should fight it out amongst themselves, see who lands at the top of the pile, and he'll fight whoever that is. I'm not mad at that. He's in a position to demand that. He doesn't have that many fights left. He has talked very seriously about retiring when he's 37. He's 32 now. He, he, his birthday's in the summer, so he's, you know, 32 and a half, basically. He's going to be out for surgery. We know at least till May. I wouldn't be surprised if it's longer. He is going to pick and choose 
his fights, his remaining fights, maybe he's got five more, eight more for Lucky. I'm not sure he'll get that many fights in before he retires. He's going to be very careful about it. I don't know if we're going to see a rematch with Bivol. I think he recognized that his ambitions in that case got ahead of him. He bit off more than he could chew. I'm not sure a rematch does a lot for him. We'll see. In the meantime, Bivol is going to carry on. Bivol is going to fight a fairly challenging opponent in Gilberto Ramirez. What if Zurdo wins? Well, then we've got another discussion, except that Canelo is still out for surgery. So all this is to say, I, I don't think people should get too wound up with what Claressa said as having any greater sociological meaning. She's sort of looking at the track record and sort of bluntly laying box rec out there saying Canelo hasn't fought anyone who is Latino or a person of color really in years. Me. I mean, that's the truth. He hasn't. I don't think it's because of who they are. It is because of what they bring or don't bring to the table. He had no problem doing this when the risk to reward ratio was so much different. You know, at one time it was Canelo who said, listen, I'm willing to risk a loss for a huge payday and a huge platform in front of a massive audience that I've never had before. And so he took the fight with Floyd Mayweather. You know, and he, he got his ass kicked. He got schooled by Floyd, but he learned from it. And he also made a ton of money and got in front of a whole new audience that didn't know anything about him before. That's when you do it. When you're 23, not when you're 33. You know, nobody would be criticizing Floyd for doing the same thing. And he did. So... This is the way boxing goes, and I get it. Fans do not have to love it. It's the whole issue of not getting the fights we want to see happen, but these guys have paydays to preserve, careers they're looking at. You know, sometimes they can please us at the same time, and if they do, we're lucky. And that's the end of my rant. And for those who didn't hear what Shields had to say again, you can check out the latest episode of The Last Man Podcast with Brian Custer. Um, and you can listen for yourself. I'll go to you, Daniel, your reaction to uh, what Shields had to say about Canelo and some of the backlash that she's received. Part of it, I, I, I agree with what a lot of Gail says. Part of it, it comes from the fact that people don't like when strong women, particularly strong black women, voice their opinion on certain, on almost anything, to be honest. And with Clarissa, because she is very blunt, well, she does speak, she just get, gets a little bit of flack, because sometimes, I will admit, sometimes what she says can get her in trouble. She would remember when she went, when she did say, that's right, Unc, when that entire fiasco with Satagi happened. That's part of one of the things that she has to carry still as part of this situation. But when it comes into this, into this situation, from what she said, okay, I know some of the backlash was, was Floyd White or... He did fight Trout when Trout was it was considered a good good fighter. He fought Arslani Lara, who is <clears throat> black Cuban, and probably you can make an argument in some ways he may have lost to him. But what happens in this stage when it comes to Canelo is that yeah, I, I thought he lost to Lara. Yeah, that was that was a very very close fight. Yeah, that makes three of us, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what happens, unfortunately, when it comes to in this particular situation is 
how far Canelo is above right now in the pecking order, even well, even with losing the bill, how far above he is in the pecking order when it comes to boxing and arguably the inability of everybody else who has been clamoring for his name to not try to handle their business correctly while trying to get that Canelo golden ticket. And I specifically target Andrade and the Charlos, both of them. Because Andrade has been one of the boogeymen fighters when it comes to uh, a lot of the boxing circles when it comes to Canelo. That his skill set, the way his body is, his range, his reach would be a trouble for Canelo. But we've never seen it because Andrade, unfortunately, for as good as he is in the ring, <coughs> outside of the ring, when it comes to business, he has been his own worst enemy. Should we remind everybody how he, because he listened to Jay-Z, wound up screwing up a fight with Mel, I think it was Mel Charlo, where he could have gotten on Showtime, he could have gotten a high profile, and would have made a stronger case for it. But, but, but because he listened to Jay-Z, he backed out of the fight, and his career has not been the same since. And now when it comes to when it comes to Jamal, because Jamal is the bigger one, is the one that would probably move up if necessary. He hasn't really done as I said, he hasn't done enough to warrant a case when you're trying to get somebody that's that high in the pecking order with Canelo, where it looks like all you're doing is making the making a payday. In that front. But that also now falls into the other fighter that Gail mentioned, and it's the fighter that people want to talk, that people talk about for other reasons when it comes to Canelo, is Benavides. Those two, Charlo and Benavides, probably be the best two opponents on the PBC side that they could get against Canelo, particularly Benavides. Now, we should point out that in the post-fight press conference that they had when Canelo was answering the questions regarding the comments that he made a few years back about not fighting Mexican fighters, and particularly when it came to Benavides, while Canelo did pretty much say, talk that, it, that Benavides Sr. was talking shit and what has he done? He's only won one belt in that front. He never really shied away from saying, like, no, no, I'm fully backing away from my statement. I will fight other Mexican fighters that are world champions. He never really backed away from it. So you have to force the issue when it comes into these type of fights. Now, we know we're, we're not going to see this until next year. We're, in, we're not going to see these until next year. So in the meantime... Canelo said it, friendly. Everybody fight each other and who is going to come out on top? Who's going to come out and be that challenger? Because right now, Canelo probably is looking at one and maybe two other fighters right now when he comes back. Depending how he heals his hand, I could see him try to push a rematch against Bivol. Even though in the size difference made itself pretty apparent in that. Or if he really wants to truly say, I'm backtracking off my stance on fighting other Mexicans, if Zerto wins the fight, and then he has to fight Zerto, who, by the way, in the boxing lore when it comes to sparring sessions, supposedly has a Mayweather Spadafora relationship with Canelo. Supposedly? You know, we don't have the footage. It. We don't have the footage, though. <laughs> we don't have the footage. With Spadafora, we have the footage. I've seen clips of it. 
He did I put it too much. Yeah. But that's that's the other difference, and that's the key word. But in this case, it's just the way things have fallen. It's just unfortunately the way things have fallen. Now, if Adon if Adonis Stevenson never would have gotten severely injured at the hands of Bostic, if he would have beaten Bostic and still maintained the fight, that would have been a good fight to make with Canelo. But unfortunately, that hasn't happened. It's just unfortunate the way that things have shaped up in the weight divisions that you're in when it comes to Canelo. And particularly when it comes to black fighters, particularly African-American fighters. I'll, once you get into the real, into that middle area of the weights, the super middleweights, the light heavyweights, and the cruiserweights, at this stage, right now, in 2022, that is a field that is almost completely utterly dominated either by A, Canelo, or, for the most part, Eastern European fighters. And Dorticos. Dorticos is still there. <laughs> but there's not, unfortunately, a lot that we can judge from that as far as we can see what can challenge was Canelo. But unfortunately, Canelo is also a very polarizing, polarizing figure in the sport. And because he's been a very poor, polarizing figure in the sport, he's whenever you mention his name, there's going to be severe backlash, no matter if what you're saying is technically correct. Like what Clarissa said, it's technically correct, but because of the way she said it, and because, unfortunately, she is an African-American woman, she gets this flack. Now, like I said, there's a whole other conversation you have when it comes to how it's this can be viewed in the Latin, Latin American community, but that's a completely different Pandora's box. I don't think we don't have to deal with at the moment, but the facts are what they are. Like Canelo's at a state right now where he can pick whoever he wants to fight because he's earned that right. And it's on upon everybody else to make the case that he has to fight him. When it came to Trout, Trout made this case because he beat Cotto when it was when it was going to be lined up for Canelo to fight Cotto much earlier than he did. Laura literally had to step up to Canelo in a press conference in order to get the fight because he pissed off Canelo that much. These are the things that you need to do in order to get a fight in that area. And do not make it a desperate point. You have to make it a point where yeah, I get the payday, but Especially not after, after losing to Bivol, you're not invincible anymore, my dude. You never, you never have been. I can beat you in a different way than Biv than Bivol beat you. It's there now. It's upon everybody else to make their case. Uh, because uh, what she said has kicked off so much dust right over the past uh, uh, 12 to 24 hours, um, I thought, I felt that we had to take some time out to, we had to devote some time, excuse me, uh, 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 to it. And I think we want to end things on that low note. I think I will say is this, is that, as I said, when I setting this story up, um, I get what she was trying to say. It was just poor word choice on her part. Does she have a point? Yes. Was it done in great context? Not necessarily. Um, I don't always like the way Canelo goes about his business, even though I understand uh, power dynamics and he has the ultimate power dynamic, even though he lost to Bivol this year, he's in a power play position where he can do whatever he wants, right? Uh, he has the pick of, a, of the litter, litter from of fights. Um, it's true. That 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 Andrade has done his fair share of things to f his career up. It's true that Char that Jamal the Jamal Charlo has made some mistakes on the business side in his career right now. If we're going to be completely honest here, is in a bit of flux. 
it's true that that Benavidez had also messed some things up his career. Uh, first with uh, uh, testing positive for the Coco, and then uh, missing weight and losing his belt. Uh, the reality is he should be WBC super. The reality is he could have been in a position to fight Canelo because he would have been WBC champion, right, at 168. That being said, I don't like how dismissive Canelo has been, particularly of Andrade and and charlo um be, be, and and I'll, I'll i'll stand on my square and say that there are a lot of people and a lot of fans if you really in pundits if you really hold their feet to the fire they will want to see him fight they will want to see him fight ben uh uh Andrade. they will want to see him fight charlo they definitely want to see him fight a benavidez over a rematch with Baval, given how Baval thoroughly outboxed him the first time around, and just do do not know if, if Canelo could do things to turn that around if they were to run it back again. But it is what it is with Canelo; he could make those moves. Uh, Shields pointed that out again. She could have done a she could have done it in a better way without giving him without putting her in this much of, of controversy and receiving this much backlash afterwards. And I think we're going to uh, uh, end things on that. You know, going to go around the panel here, uh, begin the show with ladies first. In the show with ladies first, as I said at the very beginning of the show, no real prominent fights of note this weekend. Uh, so we're going to do, so we just did fight recaps and news. Uh, Gail from Communities Digital News and why fights. Uh, for those who want to talk the sweet science, for those who want to talk media for those who want to get in contact with you especially fellow boxers and hire you as a pr person um let the folks know where they can hit you up well first of all i enjoy my role as a sports writer and journalist so uh you know if you're if you're in need of that kind of help i'll chat with you but i kind of <laughs> like my, i kind of like my seat on the outside at this point and you can see <laughs> all of that at nyfights.com Tom. I am the West Coast office with some attitude. Um, and although the schedule is very, very light and we didn't do any specific previews, it isn't that there isn't anything going on. There are fights this weekend. Um, very few cards other than club level stuff in the United States. Um, and I believe on Saturday, October 1st, we do have a fight card in Tijuana of some interest. I believe Luis Neary is fighting this weekend. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, we're just I can't. I can't with him. Know. He's talking but, about someone who just really messed up his career. Yeah. You talk, talk about somebody who, you know, is 32 and one and third, thoroughly disgraced, which is just such a shame. Also on that card, however, is um, one of the women's all time great and pioneers and you are going to have many chances to see her in the ring um again jackie nava who uh is la princesa azteca fighting um uh, one more bout she's 39 four and four you know and she is still going at it um and she's one of the real class acts and and truly a pioneer of women's boxing they are fighting in tijuana so you know what to do if you want to see that fight. Um, I'll go to you, Daniel, uh, for those who want to, Daniel of uh, For Boxing News and The Inscriber, for those who want to uh, check you out talking boxing, for those who want to check you out talking professional wrestling, for those who want to get in contact with you and, and chop it up with you when it comes to the NBA specifically uh, as it pertains to the Miami Heat, let the folks know where they can hit you up or how they can hit you up. All right, folks, you can find me on Twitter. <clears throat> Ruckus 99, R A W K U Z 99. Definitely, like I said, catch me on there. And yeah, it is a very, very light schedule, but that's only the beginning of October. We have it. We have, looks to be a very, very glorious month for fights coming up in October. And hopefully, we get to spice things up for the remainder of the year. And definitely, definitely have to watch. The, and we have to do watch also the NFL because uh, 
Dolphins somehow are three and zero, and apparently, I found a phenomenon that's actually literally called two and on. So, yeah. <laughs> and speaking of the, uh, uh, um, you mentioned the Dolphins. You mentioned the NFL. Uh, I want to uh, thoughts and prayers uh, to those in Florida. Um, Take all precautions when it comes to Hurricane Ian. I believe that's the name of the uh, latest hurricane that's in the Gulf is heading towards Florida. I know the Tampa Bay Bucks um, have relocated. Um, there are plenty of games uh, in that state, in the state of Florida, that has been uh, uh, rescheduled, if not outright postponed. Is even affecting. It's going to going to affect uh, uh, events in my state. I know there are a lot of football games. Uh, college football games, high school football games in my in where I reside here in South Carolina uh, that's being pushed up because we're expecting to see receive heavy rain over the weekend, right? So again, uh, uh, thoughts and prayers go out to the people who are in the path of Hurricane Ian and, 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 and please take all precautions. If it means that you have to leave uh, while this hurricane passes through, please, please do so, right? For those who want to talk boxing, music, fitness, you know what it is with me on Twitter, Brother JR, at Brother JR76. For those who want to talk boxing music, fitness and fragrance with me on IG, you know what it is there, Brother JRSC, right? On the next episode of Pound for Pound Box Report, what I may do is, because there was nothing really taking place this weekend, I may take um, next week off uh, and focus on what is a loaded, what has become a loaded um October 15th in particular, right? Uh, planning to do the uh, next uh, rendition of a Ladies Love boxing uh, series of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report during the week of the 15th. So just a, a quick, just a bit of a rundown here was all that's going to happen on the 15th. Uh, the rescheduled uh, women's card at the O2 Arena in London, Clarissa Shields, Savannah Marshall, Michaela Maya, Alicia Bumgartner, uh, that's happening in London on ESPN Plus. Um, in Brooklyn, um, at Barclays on PBC and Fox Pay Per View, the return of Deontay Wilder, who's fighting uh, Robert Hellenius on that card. Caleb Plant is going to fight um, Anthony Durrell. Um, Gary Antoine Russell, he's returning to fight um, Emmanuel Rodriguez. Frank Sanchez is on that card. Also on the 15th, 15th here in the United States, is going to be on the 16th. In Melbourne, Australia, you have the rematch between Devin Haney and and and, and George Cambosas. Uh, there's also a women's title fight. Um, Yamalith Mercado, she's defending her WBC Junior Featherweight title. Um, that's all happening on the 15th. So what I may do is uh, take next week off and return the following week, which would be the week of what is a loaded October 15th. Uh, fingers crossed. Uh, the latest. Ser the latest in the series of Ladies Love Boxing Report. And for those who do not know what that is, um, every year um, I devote uh, an episode of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. Uh, Daniel, he gets the night off, right? And any other dude who, who wants to appear on the show gets the night off. And it's myself, Gail, and the rest of the panel is consisting of only women's, an FLO, if you will, for ladies only episode, for ladies only panel of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. Last last year, uh, uh, outstanding uh, ladies love boxing episodes. If you check out the Pound for Pound Box Report Twitter page, I got that pinned on as I got that pinned on the page. So if you want to check that particular episode to get ready for what we're going to do in a couple of weeks, uh, please do so. Please check out Pound for Pound Box Report uh, Twitter page. As I said at the beginning, for those who want to check out all things regarding Pound for Pound Box Report. The site is the place to go to, p4pboxingreport.com. I missed this. I didn't say this at the beginning, but if you wish to email us, you can do so. Comments, questions, suggestions, etc. You can email us, p4pboxing at p4pboxingreport.com. Also on the site, uh, you can see, you can find the links to the YouTube channel, the Twitter page, the Tumblr page, the IG page, uh, links to where you can donate, got cash me, PayPal donation links. Um, uh, and also, last but certainly not least, uh, also links to uh, where you can find the podcast on all RSS feeds.
feed distribution platforms, be it distributed platforms like like Spotify, like Anchor, like Google Podcasts, like Apple Podcasts, anywhere and everywhere else in between. And certainly, it's not last but least, uh, the links to Beach Body on Demand. Again, again, I strongly advise, I strongly suggest you take advantage of the free 14 day trial that runs throughout the year on Beach Body on Demand. So, I want to thank uh, EJ Boxing Live, who was checking this out earlier. Uh, 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 he commented in the live chat. Um, for Gail from Communities Digital News and NY Fights, for Daniel of Four Boxing News and the Inscriber, this has been episode 379 of the Pound for Pound Boxing Report. Again, uh, fingers crossed, all roads are pointing towards um, the next episode will be uh, uh, the latest rendition of the Ladies Love Boxing uh, series. Uh, we'll see you hopefully in two weeks. For Gail, for Daniel, I'm your host, Michael. We'll see you guys next time. Everyone have a good evening. Good night.